You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. William C. Hudson was a New York political reporter in the 19th century, and he has some great stories. We'll hear a few today. One is about his discovery of a young legislator. There came up from the 21st Assembly District of New York County in the year 1882 to a seat in the lower house of the legislature, a young man, 23 years old, who immediately took a conspicuous position. The young man was Theodore Roosevelt. He came to the same hotel at which I lived and occupied a seat at the table in the restaurant, at the head of which, by virtue of long years of possession, I had a seat. The others at the table were young men from New York City, serving either in the House of the Legislature, friends of Roosevelt, most of whom, if not all, of the same walk of life. These bright fellows, bubbling over with youth, energy, and ambition, made the meal hours gay. And to these gatherings, Mr. Roosevelt brought all those qualities, which have since been impressed upon the country, indeed upon the civilized world, a strong personality. Abundant vigor, great energy of mind, a combative positiveness, whether right or wrong, and an intense interest in all that concerned humanity. It was Roosevelt's habit to come into the breakfast room with a rush, copies of all the morning papers, and seating himself to go through those papers with a rapidity that would have excited the jealousy of the most rapid exchange editor. He threw each paper as he finished it on the floor, unfolded, until at the end there was on either side of him a pile of loose papers as high as the table for the servants to clear away. And all this time he would be taking part in the running conversation of the table. Had anyone supposed this inspection of the papers was superficial, he would have been sadly mistaken. Roosevelt saw everything, grasped the sense of everything, and formed an opinion on everything which he was eager to maintain at any risk. In the first year of his service in the assembly, it was frequently called the Scotch Terrier. And it is to be admitted that in those years there was a strong suggestion that of that pugnacious and courageous breed in his appearance and manner, in debate he stood at his seat, snapping and barking out his pregnant sentences, caring little whom he attacked. So long as he believed himself to be right, his democracy and his aggressive defense of the public against the abuses of combined wealth, were as marked when he was in the assembly at 23 or 24 as in later years when he sat in the White House. I have a vivid recollection of the speech delivered by him in the assembly when he denounced the guilty rich and the criminal rich. Thus it was that I was able to observe at short range a great man in the making, and I recall with no little satisfaction that in those days when Roosevelt was under discussion by his companions, as he frequently was, my invariable prediction was that Teddy would yet be heard from in the upper regions of politics. Recently, I've read at a conclusion of a writer, obviously affected by the revealed greatness of Mr. Roosevelt, that Roosevelt exercised a commanding influence over Grover Cleveland during the two years that the latter was governor. Nothing could be farther from the truth. In their intellectual constitutions and their mental habits and processes, they were diametrically opposite. Cleveland arrived at his conclusions through laborious thought. There is nothing inspirational about him. The natural tendencies of his mind were confirmed into habit by the practice of law. Roosevelt, in those years at least, seemed wholly inspirational. His mental processes were so rapid that he apparently reached his conclusions instantaneously, and he seemed to be surprised when his opinions were not taken at his own valuation of them. Roosevelt was a frequent caller on the governor, At this time, Grover Cleveland is governor of New York, but not more so than other members of his party in the assembly. To Cleveland, Roosevelt was a perplexity. The governor liked the assembly even personally, but the latter's peculiar mental attitude bothered the executive. The governor would sit large, solid, and phlegmatic, listening gravely to the energetic utterances of the mercurial young man. 
but signifying neither assent nor descent. Not infrequently, taking silence for acquiescence, Roosevelt would go away thinking that he had carried everything before him. Now, William C. Hudson, the political reporter, in his random reflections of an old political reporter, is going to go on from here, go on from here, and describe such an incident. So we have a fly on the wall as the meeting between Roosevelt, Theodore Roosevelt, and Grover Cleveland, uh, two men who are in the future going to be president. One day while I was standing at the private secretary's desk with Lamont, watching Grover Cleveland at the executive desk, Lamont said, I have never seen those two together that I'm not reminded of a picture I have of a great mastiff solemnly regarding a small terrier, snapping and barking at him. One day I asked the governor his opinion of Roosevelt. There is great sense in a lot of what he says, but there is such cocksuredness about him that he stirs up doubt in me all the time. Turning to Lamont, he asked, Dan, and, and Lamont is Grover Cleveland's secretary, both in the New York governor's office and in the White House, a trusted advisor. Dan, didn't you say to me the other day that someone said of Macaulay that he wished that he was as sure of one thing as Macaulay was of all things? Lamont replied in the affirmative. Then he said to me, that fits Roosevelt. Then he seems to be so very young. Well, he was. And it was in 1882 that Roosevelt introduced a number of bills related to the city and county of New York, some of them reducing free fee offices to salaried offices. He passed them with great effort and against serious opposition. One day after the legislature had adjourned and Roosevelt was in attendance on the Republican convention at Chicago that nominated Blaine. This would be the 84 convention. The governor, at work on the 30-day bills as the past measures were left unacted upon by the executive on adjournment, were called, said to me, I shall have to veto the most of those Roosevelt reform bills. Not that I object to the principles involved, but the bills are so loosely drawn that they will be as laws ineffective, and they'll give endless trouble. A day or two later, while walking down State Street, in Albany, I met Roosevelt, who was on his way home from Chicago, and who had stopped off in Albany to look after his legislation. He immediately asked what the governor had done with his bills. And I replied, as yet, the governor had done nothing, that I thought that he intended to veto some of them. Without seeking to know why, Roosevelt exclaimed, He mustn't do that. I won't let him do it. I'll go up and see him at once. He fairly flew up the hill, having in my mind that old stock problem as to what would be the result of an irresistible force meeting an immovable body, and perceiving some fun ahead, I followed after him into the executive chamber. The contest was begun immediately by Roosevelt's asking what the governor proposed to do about his bills. Mr. Roosevelt, replied the governor, I must veto them. While I'm not opposed to the principles involved... The bills are so loosely drawn that if they were made laws by the city and county of New York, they would be plunged into prolonged and expensive litigation. Roosevelt bristled up immediately and after stating that the main thing was the establishment of the principle and combating the idea that litigation must follow, he went into a forceful argument in which he used the most vigorous language, pounding the desk for emphasis. Finally, he concluded with these words, You must not veto these bills. You cannot. You shall not. I can't have it, and I won't have it. Mr. Roosevelt, said the governor, sitting up very straight in his chair, I am going to veto those bills. And his fist came down on the desk with a solid whack. The irresistible force had been smashed on the immovable body. Roosevelt fell back in his chair, declaring it was an outrage to overturn a year's worth of work in that way. Lamont went to the window and looked out on the green in an endeavor to get rid of the broad smile that was plastered on his face. 
Roosevelt continued to talk, and with hard and stubborn front, Cleveland turned to his work, and the interview was over. The bills were vetoed. Now, William C. Hudson names this story Roosevelt in the Making. And, uh, I mean, I think a couple of things. The omnipresence of a political reporter like Hudson in those days, just being able to walk around and things are pretty uh, open to him. And he knows most of the people. And, in fact, politicians are getting information from him. The presence of two people that are going to become president, of course, a different view of, of Roosevelt. And also, at the time that his account is written, 1911, kind of a greater view of, of Grover Cleveland than we might have today, where, where only Roosevelt remains in the memory today, not so in 1911. You know what the issue is. You want to read a lot of books. We all do, right? We're lovers of knowledge. We don't have time. I've got a full-time job in addition to this podcast and I'm sure you've got a lot of stuff going on. And you feel like you're missing something. I do very often. That's why short form is great. Short form, think of it as amped up book summaries. It's adding material to the text. Here's an example. I'm reading Machiavelli's The Prince right now. And I'm reading a one-page summary. It's talking about who Machiavelli was, why he wrote the book. How did this one book in something that was a very common genre, people writing instruction manuals, in a sense, for princes, how did this rise to the top? The guide takes 26 lessons from Machiavelli and puts it into four main sections. What did Machiavelli really believe about republicanism and, and monarchy? Where does Machiavelli contradict himself? So you're going to learn all of these things in a very, you know, summarized fashion. The books that I wanted to see were covered. The Federalist Papers, The Deficit Myth, Doris Kearns Goodwin, Leadership in Turbulent Times, Malcolm Gladwell's The Tipping Point. You get the point. There's a lot of books in here that uh, I'd like to read. Thomas Sowell, Basic Economics. Glad to have him as an advertiser. A perfect fit for My History Can Beat Up Your Politics because what are we doing, right? We're just acquiring knowledge and trying to understand stuff. So go it's shortform.com slash my history. That's shortform.com slash my history. You're going to get 20% off and you get a five day free trial. Sign up now. Hudson also tells the story of a meeting that he witnessed with Samuel J. Tilden, who was the loser of the 1876 election, at least in the history books. But to many at the time of 1866, he was robbed of the presidency. And he records his actions, um, in, again, in a kind of fly-on-the-wall way. Whatever may have been the opinion of the Republican leaders as to Samuel J. Tilden, governor of New York, as a man, as a politician, as a candidate, prior to his entrance in the field of national politics, it is quite certain that the campaign was barely organized when they realized they had been met with the most formidable and aggressive opposition of their history. Now, let's get some context here on what Hudson's saying. Tilden's running in 1876. Democrats have not won a presidential election for 20 years now. And they've been tarnished, of course, by the Civil War, where there were a group of Democrats, Copperheads, that supported the South. And there's still many Democrats now originating and entering Congress after amnesty from the South. So that's their brand, and that's a tough one in the North. Since the war had ended, the country had been through three presidential campaigns, in all of which the Republicans had waved the flag of the Union, announcing themselves as the only rightful custodians. They were intolerant and arrogant in their treatment of their opponents. Every Democrat is a copperhead, was their cry. The Democrats, placed on the defensive, weakly submitted to the arrogance, waged as best they could apologetic campaigns, and went down to successive defeats. 
But in 1876, the conditions were changed. The situation was wholly different. By a dexterous turn, the Republicans were placed on the defensive. That party was paying the penalty of 16 years of uninterrupted power. Crimes committed by Republican office holders, scandals involving distinguished Republican names, wrongs appearing in the very seats of power, and abuses that called for remedy clogged the record of the second administration of Grant. Fresh from the destruction of the Tweed Ring, this is Boss Tweed controlling politics in New York, you know, Samuel J. Tilden as governor, uh, even though he's a Democrat and Tweed's associated with the Tammany Hall Democrats, Tilden's going to be responsible for breaking the Tweed Ring and the Canal Ring in the state of New York. Tilden mounted the platform of the Democratic Party, which had arraigned the Republican Party at the bar of public opinion and drew the sword of reform, so says Hudson. In the beginning, it was not realized how thoroughly Tilden had mapped out the field of the contest. The Republicans went through the old trick of lifting the flag of the Union, sounding the horn of patriotism, and waving the bloody shirt. This was a way, you know, of... uh, Republican politicians at the time would show the bloody shirt as one congressman did in the floor of Congress, show the shirt of a man that had been attacked during the Reconstruction by what um, what he described as mob violence, you know, and denouncing his traitors all who opposed him. But the crimes, the scandals, the wrongs and the abuses were there and had been exposed to the light. The Democratic platform summed them up in the following words. When the annals of this republic show the disgrace and censure of a vice president, a late Speaker of the House of Representatives, marketing his rulings as a presiding officer, three senators profiting secretly from their votes as lawmakers, five chairmen of the leading committees of the late House of Representatives exposed in jobbery, a late Secretary of the Treasury forcing balances in the public accounts, a late Attorney General misappropriating public funds. Tilden is going through the wrongs of the Grant administration at the time. A secretary of the Navy enriched or enriching friends by percentages levied off the profits of contractors with his department. An ambassador to England censured in a dishonorable speculation. The president's private secretary, this is Orville Babick, barely escaping conviction on trial for his guilty complicity in frauds upon the revenue, and a secretary of war impeached for high crimes and misdemeanors. The demonstration is complete that the first step in reform must be the people's choice of honest men from another party. Lest the disease of one political organization infect the body politic, and lest by making no change of men or parties we get no change of measures and no real reform. At first, this plank in the platform did not attract so much attention. It was overshadowed in the beginning. Later, it was found that the bloody shirt had been met in advance by this plank. The platform reads, For the democracy of the whole country, we do here affirm our faith in the permanence of the Federal Union, our devotion to the Constitution of the United States, with its amendments universally accepted as a final settlement of the controversies that engendered civil war and do here record our steadfast confidence in the perpetuity of Republican self-government. Small R Republican, but nonetheless, the Democrats are making a point in their 1876 platform. We're back. We're in the Union. Don't call us traitors. We're part of this government. In the acceptance of the results of Reconstruction, the plank of arraignment loomed up as the main thing in the campaign. The vice president arraigned was Colfax of Indiana. The speaker was Blaine of Maine. The secretary of treasury was Richardson of Massachusetts, attorney general Williams of Oregon. The secretary of the Navy was Robeson of New Jersey. Ambassador to England was Schneck of Ohio. Private secretary was Babbock of Vermont. The secretary of war was Belknap of Iowa. For the campaign orders, the names made concrete instances of wrongdoings that were rehearsed to the humiliation of Republicans. It's true. Going into this 1876 election, the Grant administration has a lot of scandals on it. And it's pretty easy to make campaign speeches and somewhat hard to defend. Their only defense is, again, going to that argument that 
Democrats are not patriots and and uh, they had done what they could to counter. Now, I want to say that Hudson's pointing out the change in the Democratic platform because there was a change in that outright acceptance of the Constitution of the United States. They'd always done that. They always thought they were defending the Constitution. But in terms of accepting the um, amendments to the Constitution as the final settlement of the controversies, in other words, accepting the Reconstruction, um, the party is taking a stand that they may not have really taken, certainly not in the 1868 election, where the Democratic Party, if elected, if Horatio Seymour became president, they would have tried to change some of that. So let's just make that point clear. Now it's all about corruption. They can focus freely on corruption. From every Democratic platform will rehearse the scandals of the Freedmen's Bureau, the Credit Mobilier, the whiskey frauds, and the tombstone contract. I don't even know what the tombstone contract is, but I'll figure it out later. Everywhere, the great Republican Party was on the defensive. The hopes of Democratic success rose with each day's development until the elections of October came. Now, here's a, another little historical context here. At this time, we're talking 1876, a few states had early elections. They had elections in October instead of November. And they were really as good as an opinion poll, as good as you could get back then, to figure out where the country was. The drift towards Tilden was so surely shown that absolute conviction as to final success in November possessed all those in the management of the Tilden campaign. The American people are calling the great reformer to Washington to clean out the stables of the federal government, cried out Abram S. Hewitt. In an ecstasy of elation, he was the head of the Democratic Party at that time. So they did in November by a majority of 250,000 on the popular vote. How three states that had given a majority for Tilden were changed to give Hayes a majority in the Electoral College in 1876 is too much of a matter for history to be rehearsed here. For years thereafter, fraud triumphant was a Democratic asset in political campaigns. Though in the days immediately following the November election, the Republicans put forth their claims, yet the leaders moved forward with great caution, much as an elephant crossing marshy ground pats the earth before he places his weight on it. As the intent of the party became clearer, the Democratic rank and file watched eagerly for some expression from Samuel Tilden, some declaration from the candidate they had elected, that he knew his rights and, knowing them, dared maintain them. But not a word came from him, nor was anyone authorized to speak for him. Day by day, the Republicans became bolder in urging their claims, gloom, and silence enshrouded the candidate-elect. It was known that he was holding daily conferences in his house in Gramercy Park, but over what, and as to what, none knew. Uh, if you ever go to New York City, and you go to Gramercy Park, which is um, near Union Square, but it's this kind of enclave area still today, and the park, you actually have to be a resident of the area to have a key to the park. Um, Samuel Tilden's mansion is there. It's a um, it's a now a club dedicated uh, for the arts, but it is a uh, which has some membership rules, and some people live there in his old mansion. But that his mansion still remains there in Gramercy Park in New York City, worth a visit. Not so much just for Samuel Tilden alone, but just the whole environs of Gramercy Park worth a visit. In the meantime, a large number of Democrats from the various states of the Union had gathered in New York City. Finally, they were brought into conference with some of the New York leaders. It was proposed by someone that Tilden should be induced to make a public utterance that would hearten the faithful and correct the notion that he was supine under the attempt to take from him the fruits of victory. This was agreed to. So an audience with Tilden was sought and arranged. At the head of this delegation was placed a distinguished citizen of one of the southern states, a man occupying a high official position and a forceful presence. No publicity was given to the visit. On the contrary, an effort was made to keep it secret. And one newspaper man taken into confidence was pledged to silence and secrecy. 
He was this writer. The visit was made. Tilden received the deputation with the celebrated lawyer Charles O'Connor beside him. It was suggested to Tilden that he should be made the recipient of a serenade and appearing on his own doorstep, briefly declare that he had been elected the President of the United States, that the effort to deprive him of the office was a crime to which he would not willingly, willingly submit that he would do all that was proper for him to do to prevent the consummation of the crime, and that he expected to take his seat. Okay, so let's put things in perspective here. 1876 election, we're in the aftermath of it. States are still deciding, and Congress is about to decide which electoral votes it's going to accept. Eventually, it's going to go to a congressional commission. What this group of Democrats from around the country want Tilden to do is to declare himself president. And listen, I mean, there's a clear majority here, 250,000 votes. Also, another factor in Tilden's favor is that up in the north where Democrats hadn't been doing well, he wins the states of New York and Indiana, um, which are the important swing states in this election. Clear evidence that, you know, the country's tilting towards him. It's just in these southern states where there's reconstruction governments controlling the vote totaling that they're able to switch and send Hayes electors out. So we'll make that clear, that there's actually a a case here. This isn't totally without a case. Anyway, they ask him, prevent the consummation of the crime, and that he expected to take his seat. Tilden stood up before the deputation, silent for a long time, in deep thought, with no expression on his face. After a while, he turned to Mr. O'Connor and whispered in his ear. Mr. O'Connor nodded his head affirmatively and emphatically. Tilden whispered again, and again the great lawyer confirmed the whispered words by nods. After this, Mr. Tilden turned to the deputation and with great deliberation asked, Would that not be an overt act of treason? A hush fell on the room. Not a word was spoken until the deputation leader, in a tone of the utmost contempt, gave withering expression to a word that should not be printed here. Then he turned and followed silently by the deputation, went out of the house. William C. Hudson, fly on the wall, the one reporter available to see this event, where possibly Tilden could have gotten something started, which could have led to either great political disruption or possibly violence. And he saw how he handled it. That's one way to lose a political election. I hope you enjoyed these stories. There's no replacement for something like a Hudson um, viewing events at the time. I want to thank you for listening. The website is www.myhistorycanbeatupyourpolitics.com. If you like the program, please tell someone else about the program. Uh, We were happy to be on C-SPAN recently. That just comes from the support that we get from listeners and that the you know, that the podcast is seen out there. So I appreciate anyone mentioning this podcast really helps. Thanks so much.